I sat down with Jason Allen from Allen Law to have a conversation about estate planning topics for people who are getting ready to retire. And one of the things we talked about is the types of situations where estates end up in courts. And specifically, I wanted to know from Jason, what are the common threads that he sees in his practice for estates that end up being in dispute and the things that people can do to help avoid their own estate uh, being thrown into dispute once they're no longer here. And with that, I'll turn it over to my conversation with Jason Allen. And when you see or you come across situations where there are uh, challenges to wills that end up going in front of judges, like what are the big issues? Are, do, you, do you see any common threads there? And what if there are common threads, like what that means for someone who's listening to this or watching this video, things to kind of watch out for pitfalls where it's like, hey, I don't want to have my estate end up trapped in some kind of a, a court procedure by it being challenged. Like what are those common scenarios that people may want to kind of keep in their mind when they're thinking, okay, I need to take care of this because if this is a common pitfall, you know, maybe this could apply to me and I need to make sure it doesn't happen. Yeah, I think one of the uh, things that I find uh, that can result in problems with an estate is if a, if a beneficiary really has deflated expectations and is surprised by the result in the will, right? Mm -hmm. So say, say you have a, a person who has uh, three children and they've led their children implicitly or explicitly to believe that the estate is going to be divided equally among mm -hmm. the three of them. And then at a later stage in life, the plan has changed and, and one child uh, is left a greater share than the mm. others. And the person who has done the will may have a perfectly good reason for doing that. And uh, it could be a you know, justifiable reason. But the, uh, if the other children haven't been made aware of, mm. the, of the change uh, and are disappointed by the result, um, that, that's, that could... That, that's sometimes I find a factor in, mm. uh, in disputes. They don't believe that it was uh, the free will of the parent to make that change, depending on the parent's change. Mm. They may believe that the parent was subject to you know, coercion or undue influence mm. uh, or you know, was otherwise pressured by the child who benefits more. Mm. You know, often in those situations, the child who gets more is the child who has been helping the parent, who may live with the parent. Mm. And of course, that can create what, what we'd call suspicious circumstances where maybe the parent has some vulnerability is reliant upon the child who was helping the parents, you know, they live together and uh, those facts can, can lead to, uh, to problems. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so sometimes if I have uh, a client who is really insistent upon leaving a greater share to one child, I might often suggest that they speak to their family about mm. their reasons for making that change, right? Because, and I point out to them that um, rightly or wrongly, uh, a bequest and a will can be seen as an expression of love. Mm. A child who is left less money may, may feel upset by that. Sure. Reasons, and feel that maybe it was an expression of love and, you know, this is not right. Uh, my other siblings took advantage of mom and, uh, and, and, uh, we're able to extract a better result in the will as a result of that. But if the, if the parent has a very good reason for wanting to benefit one child more than, than others, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I'll suggest that they maybe have a family meeting mm -hmm. or make their wishes and their, their reasons known. And then, uh, then at least the children who are, you know, who are, who are getting less in the will mm -hmm. will, will be able to appreciate that, you know, they're, they've heard it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. And,